And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. He is the leading voice, the leading Hispanic voice in science fiction. Go, a man who has been a man who has been a a multiple time repeat offender here in the temple, and and a and a man with well as good as good of taste of of board games as I have in role playing games. <laughs> That's generous. Welcome, welcome back, John Delarose. How you doing today, man? What's What's going on, Mildred? I'm having a good time. I'm just enjoying life. Mm -hmm. uh, you you mentioned you liked winter better, but I'm a summer fan. I I like to play tennis. In fact, uh, I'm going to play tennis tonight. After this, I've got a match. Uh, oh. As soon as we're done, pretty much. I so uh, yeah, good stuff. Um, if you like tennis, I'm just out of curiosity. Are you familiar with the horror that was the blue clay incident? Um, I'm familiar. They used blue clay for a while. Uh, in some instances, and then I know they stopped using it, but that's all I know. <laughs> um, it was it. This was a it was an attempt by it was an attempt to try and spice things up for the Madrid Open, given some of the color gimmicks that ha that had been making the rounds at the time. Oh yes, that makes sense. Um, but what happened is the way it turned. One would one would think that there's not much difference between playing on grass between and playing on clay, when there's actually quite a bit of difference in terms of in terms of the kind of tactics you can use. There's tons of difference, correct? Yes. Um, and I'd, if I recall correctly, I think I think clay tends to favor more aggressive players. Uh... No, actually. No, it was no, it was grass that tends to favor more aggressive. It's grass that because grass you, grass actually is is faster to hit through, mm -hmm. which is odd. You'd think it wouldn't, but they but they actually cut it so low. It, it's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. um, and clay actually slows the ball down, so it makes it difficult to hit through players. So the aggressive, hard hitting players get frustrated because they they'll hit their like you know eighty five mile an hour just like killer shot. And somebody will be able to get to it on clay, mm -hmm. uh, and so that messes with them. And then eventually they start missing because they, they start trying to hit it harder and harder, and yeah. it just doesn't work, right? Now, what it what had happened was the combination of the of the chemical treatments they'd use to make the clay blue instead instead of using the usual oxidizing agents to make it red, combined with a combined with a significant um, rainstorm that ha that happened. A few, like uh -oh. a day, a day <laughs> before. We're not talking. We're not talking like a week or so before before the show where you can where you can kind of prepare. We're talking, we're talking this this long deluge that la that last that lasted up until I think two days before before the Madrid Open that year caused caused a a crystallized film to to crop up on the on the clay. Oof. And made everything all the more slippery. And the interviews afterwards made it perfectly clear: nobody, men or women, liked the blue clay thing. And afterwards, the the WTA banned it. That makes sense because uh, if you think about it, like it's already difficult enough to uh, uh, change directions, especially on clay. Mm -hmm. uh, you're slip a lot of slip footing. Things like that. Uh, it's kind of dangerous because they they move so hard in those. I mean, we saw uh, Sasha Zverev at the French Open this year. Just like I mean, he tore three different ligaments and looked like he broke his ankle. It was a disaster. Because uh, so that, that's a lot of other problems. Yeah, you're going at full blast, and then you and then you have and you might have to stop and pivot. And um, I know it's been a while since physics, but you but it's not that easy to stop on a dime. It's not. It's pretty easy on concrete because it's such a like, uh, or not, you know, uh, hardcore uh, because it's such a like, it's a hard surface that you can get traction on. You just can't get traction on uh, loose clay like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But 
Me personally, the main reason I'm a, one of the main reasons I'm a winter guy, besides the fact that I can always put on more than I can take off, is I like hockey. <laughs> I do like hockey too. Hockey's fun, especially since it's the only it's the only sport where where um where no where people don't try and people don't try and break up a fight. Yeah, I mean, I had problems with the NHL getting into their little political crap, you know, when everybody else was uh, in 2020. So I pretty the, the reason I really switched to tennis was because uh, you can't really do American politics, politics in something that's not American. It makes it a lot easier in that, uh, in, to that avoid. in that vein. Would you consider watching F1? Uh, I have a couple times. I'm not super into it, but, you know, I, I get it. It looks it's, it's pretty cool. I, I like it when they get, like go down the streets of Monaco and stuff like that. You Mon know, Monaco is really always neat. is always beautiful. The only the only yeah. race I I tell people to avoid watching is Sochi because Sochi puts me to sleep. <laughs> mm. um, but I fi I figured I figured since since you bring that up, although I've I've been um I've been put I've been pushing for the longest time that F one needs to have a race in South Africa. Because Africa is the one continent that doesn't have a rep that doesn't have a representative race, and it's not like there aren't um, decent facilities in Africa. Hmm. Uh, that every, sounds neat. But every, every continent has has at least has at least one race, um, but nothing nothing for South Africa. I'd rather have that than than some people's push to return to the green hell that it that is Nurburgring. That's never happening. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> but the last the last time I had you on, we you um was was with was with a project that was certainly leaning into uh, into a lot of pulpy SF. And with Overmind, it looks like you're diving headfirst into that. Was this something? Was Overmind something that has a more recent origin or? Did you, or did the concept come up more um, in the back of your mind for a while? We were working on it even when Dave's Vault was in production. Um, so, I mean, the great thing about being a comic writer is I can actually have artists working on multiple projects at the same time. So I've actually got this, Flying Sparks Volume 5, mm -hmm. um, which is going to be the, the final uh, piece of that story, and then uh, a Western uh, that I'm working on and among a couple other smaller projects also going at the same time right now. Hmm. And uh, what, what, what that kind of does and what that helps me do is of course, like, you know, if one doesn't get done in a timely manner, I just choose a different one to crowdfund at the time. That way I can always have content coming out because, you know, my, my real goal is really to be like a pulp person and just have new books coming out all the time. That's what they used to do back in the day. And that's, mm -hmm. that's really, you know, how you become a prolific writer. And that's, that's really the, I guess, uh, it's not the aesthetic, that's not correct, but it's the, um, uh, it's the work ethic, I guess. And that, that, that's really what needs to be emulated first out of that era, I think. Um, but yes, we leaned into like a retro, as far as aesthetics go, like a retro sci-fi vibe where, you know, we're pulling from Flash Gordon, we're pulling from Weird Science, the EC comic, uh, we're pulling from, uh, uh, of course, Valerian and Loreline uh, from uh, the European comics. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's we're pulling from like Howard Chaikin's uh, sci-fi stuff. So all all that stuff does definitely play in, and we 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 gave her that sort of Flash Gordon look. We gave her a ray gun. We gave her a jetpack. We gave her a, a spaceship that like you know looks like an actual rocket, like you would see in the fifties. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we're we're bringing it back. I'm I'm definitely pulling and leaning real hard into the regress harder mantra to where we're not just trying to emulate the nineties or the two thousands. We're trying to, we're trying to bring it back. We're bringing it to the golden age. Mm -hmm. Oh, you had mentioned, you had mentioned a lot. You had, you had mentioned a lot of, a lot of, you had mentioned that it's in the style of, um, Europe of European comics, which I think this is, I think this is the first time I've seen you, re you reference, um, comic book stylings from Europe in these projects. If there w if there was one before if there was one before that, I um, I will I will stand corrected because I know a lot of things, but I can't know everything. Okay. Um, I'm cur 
what I'm curious what I'm curious about is what is besides the besides the big ones like you mentioned with Flash Gordon, what comics in Europe specifically served as an influence? Of course, the Inkall is 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 a big one from from the seventies. Uh, Valerian and Loreline, I already mentioned um, for for sci fi. Um, there's another there's another guy named Leo um, in Europe who does a really cool uh, science fiction called Alde- Aldebaran, which is a natural planet, mm-hmm. and uh, and humanity kind of colonized there. Um, and I don't I don't know that we like really copied that so much. Because it's a very different plot and all that, but I definitely like the aesthetic of it, and and I, I was reading those European comics, so I wanted to provide that they just have a more it. It's interesting. It's kind of weird. They have a wacky tone and a more serious tone at the same time, um, and that sounds contradictory, but I don't know how to explain it other than that. And I, I really like that about European comics. Yeah, and um, I think I think when a lot of people play um. Play word play word association when it comes to when it comes to European comics. Um, mo- nine times out of ten, somebody's going to bring up Mobius. <laughs> there's there's yes. just no avoiding that. I love Mobius, Mobius is but beautiful uh, work. I love. Don't get me wrong. I love Mobius to death, but it's one of those inevitable things. Um, I'd say I'd say a lot of a lot of um, a lot of fr- a lot of French works in general are going to get brought up. Um, yes. And maybe if maybe if somebody wants to deep cut, maybe if somebody wants to deep cut, they might bring up the Phantom. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. I'm I I've been reading a lot of Phantom comics. Mm-hmm. I actually got um, I'm a big collector, mm-hmm. and uh, especially with like nice hardcover editions of things. And there's this group called Hermes Press. They're a small they're a smaller press group, and they did these they did the entire editions of all the gold key and all the King comics and all of the Charlton comics, mm-hmm. phantom um, comics, not, not just the, the newspaper strips, but the actual full comics. Uh, and they collected all those in, in different hardcover editions. They're extremely hard to find now. So good luck if you want to yeah. collect those, but uh, th- beautiful stuff. And well, gold key is a, um, is an, is an important figure when just from a historian's perspective, because, a lot of this, a lot, because someone who, someone else who was a big fan of Gold Key Comics, was Jim Shooter. Yes, and a lot of a lot of the names that he that he that he wanted to work on came from Gold Key. Um, in particular, Magnus. Yes, and I wanted to get uh, the old Magnus stuff because uh, Dark Horse actually reprinted that in Turok. Uh, and of mm-hmm. course, Solar Man of the Atom, mm-hmm. uh, w- which are the three that Jim Shooter took I- into Valiant and actually kind of remade under Valiant. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, those old collections uh, for those are, are skyrocketed in price too. They're they're getting impossible to find. So we're running into a situation where these collected editions have really taken off in the market. People like to kind of binge read these things, mm-hmm. and uh, they really were not printing them even up to like a year or two ago. Uh, in the amount that there's demand for, hmm. so you can get those like uh, Magnus and Turok volumes. Those, those are going for you know a couple hundred bucks a piece. It's really rough. Yeah, um, I'm kind I'm kind of reminded of how of the pain of the pain that I had to that I had to go through when it comes to. I got I got lucky when I got a copy of Chronicles of the Imperium, the um, Dune RPG. Hmm. Um. Oh yeah, I, I saw those get way expensive. Mm-hmm. I've seen those. I've seen one in the wild. One. <laughs> I, man- I managed to. I managed to get. One- I managed to get one for se- for eighty bucks. Which, all things considered, I got. I got stupid lucky. <laughs> That's solid. Yeah. Because those things go for a whole lot more for, more than that. Because the only version that's in print is that limited edition. Um. That's right. But. When it com- but when it comes to oh, when it comes to Overmind, um, given the given the given the concepts that you're working with, um, what made you what made you want to go with a with a um AI? Because you look at a lot of um SF stories from from back then, and 
the idea of an of an AI villain is a more is a far more modern thing than it was back in the day. <laughs> yeah, well, reasons. I do live in a I do live in a modern world, mm -hmm. um, and I mean the whole story revolves around people, you know, this planet really getting jacked into this system where the AI really manipulates people's uh, thoughts, right? And then, you know, gets them into a cult. And um, my thought beyond that is, like, that is social media extrapolated. We have algorithms telling us what we see we, on, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, we have algorithms on Amazon telling us what to buy. And, you know, that's pay to play. You have to pay, pay to get into that algorithm these days. Um, even Kickstarter, like, there's this algorithm that shows up that it says it's sorted by magic. That's the default search. Um, and so I don't know how that gets done, but I'm sure there's preferential treatment to certain things that they want focused on. And, uh, you know, it's just everything is manipulated and everything we see is manipulated and ends up brainwashing us. Mm. So, yes, uh, it is kind of an allegory for that. Uh, it's it's pretty, it's not very subtle. Um until you get into it. I mean, you get in the story and it, it ends up being its own story. It's not really a, a direct one-to-one -to, -one to, to modern life. But I did want that in there as a theme because uh, that bothers me. It really bothers me how much these companies use algorithms to dictate what people think about various topics these days. Yeah, my, my mentor used to say that art is not a math problem. And Yes, it is now. <laughs> um... Well, um, well, art, well, sir, plenty of art pretends to, but then again, then again, then again, ev everybody, everybody, everybody thought that, everybody thought that Moneyball was revolutionary in baseball. Yes. Uh, and and now you got a bunch of people thinking thinking that stats are more are more important than watching film. <clears throat> and it can be to some extent, um, but you know it, it it depends. I mean, th there still is a factor of performance uh, in terms of just kind of being clutch and not choking, and that's that's hard to identify by just looking at stats. The other the other thing is that stats don't don't show a good picture of tactics. Correct. Ah. Uh. But given, but given that, given that, and give, and given the whole, given the whole thing of this being on a on a colony planet, um, is Overmind ha does Overmind have kind of a vibe of of deep cover of just this one agent who's not going to get who's comp who um is not going to be getting a whole lot of assistance this far out. Um, it, it ends up not being in deep cover. So if, I mean, if you remember, I hate to compare it to Star Wars Episode One, uh, you know, but uh, if you remember how, how the Jedi went out on the diplomatic uh, mission to kind of just see what was going on. Mm -hmm. So that, that's where she starts out in this. And she's looking at like, okay, this is a, this is a colony planet of our empire, right? And uh, so she doesn't really have a reason to believe that like it's going to be a huge danger. She thinks she can go into the governor's mansion, you know, uh, meet the guy, sort out any misunderstandings, and make a report, right? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that, you know, it's a much more insidious thing going on beneath the surface than she originally thought. And that's where uh, she starts to run into trouble. Mm -hmm. oh, it, did kind, it did kind of amuse me that even though there's certainly that rocket design with her ship, um, in some ways it kind of reminds me of the old Blackbird jets, Hmm. I'm not sure if that was intentional or not. No, we we wanted to get that rocket vibe mm -hmm. uh, from the '50s, and yeah, I, I I can see what you're saying about the blackbirds now. Mm -hmm. um, but she also like uh, my my artist wanted to incorporate a horseshoe into the design, and uh, so that's why it kind of has that. You you can actually see kind of like the uh, uh, outline of a horseshoe kind of like between the wings and and uh and that's that's definitely where that came from there um uh, speaking speaking of that how did you how did you how did you first end up meeting um uh, miss crimson 
Uh, geez, uh, how did I meet Miss Crimson? I think she just found me at some point. No, 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 no. Um, I was ta- I was working with another artist on another project, which I guess is still going. I just haven't seen anything from it. Um, sometimes, you know, these things work out. This is the reason I have a lot in the works also is comic artists don't always, uh, you know, get things done in a timely fashion. Um, and so, so, so I, I keep, you know, multiple irons in the fire with multiple artists. And I've, I have one artist who I was working with and who's done some good work for me. I don't want to denigrate him. Um, but he hasn't finished his comic for me. So if you do listen to this comic artist out there, I know what you're doing and it's not my comic. Um, <laughs> but he in- <laughs> he introduced me to Miss Crimson uh, to actually critique his work on the comic because she's been working in the industry for like 40 years. Mm-hmm. And um, I started talking with her and uh, we did. We've done another book together, which was Robo Toad back in the day. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that was just a quick thing, you know. We're just getting acquainted and all that. And we always wanted to do like a more serious uh, graphic novel together. And she has the she has very similar tastes to me, and so it just kind of worked out. I, you know, we, I started developing this concept. I want. I knew I wanted like a uh, hot redheaded superhero. Uh, sort of in space special agent uh, situation here. And uh, I, I kind of had that in the back of my mind for a long time. I think I actually got it. I think I initially got it from, from Metroid, to be honest. Um, uh, Metroid's uh, Seamus, right, um, kind of has a little bit of this vibe uh, when, she, when, she, when she's out of the suit. I guess she's not a redhead. I guess she's blonde. But oh well. But that was part of it too. Um, and because uh, I, pl- I was playing Metroid Zero Mission on the Game Boy as a kid. Did you ever play that one? Yeah. There's, I like that game. Yeah. There's not a Metroid that I haven't played. Okay. I really enjoyed that. So my first thought was like, I'll do that and I'll have a I'll have this superhero like kind of descending into a uh, sort of like, you know, ant tunnel or something uh, that's an alien species and just do Metroid. <laughs> and so I, I, I started scripting that and I looked at it and I thought, you know what, that's a little, as I, as I started kind of progressing as a writer, I was like a little too shallow for, for my abilities at this point. And so I, I actually wrote the script, I scrapped it. Um, and then I liked the character that came out of that. And I, I had like a whole handler set up and all that. And this is interesting because I don't scrap a lot of works. So as a pulp writer, I usually just go barrel full, full barrel forward and then move on to the next one. But I did, I've actually put a ton of thought into this one, so it's a little different than a lot of my projects. Mm. Um, and so I scrapped that script, which I still have on my hard drive, um, and then I re- wrote, a, like, started writing a short story uh, where I just kind of gave her origin of how she got genetically modified so she could do this, because, you know, women aren't typically equipped for things like this in general, uh, unless they have genetic modifications. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, we started talking about doing a sort of like quick short comic on Mars uh, with a dome and all that to get that vibe with it. And uh, I, she drew a couple sketches of that. And then I came up with this. And so this, this was a long process of coming up with a story that I felt was worthy of the character, was worthy of the concept and the world building that I was kind of planning in my head. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it ended up just beautiful. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very excited about this one in particular. Now, there's been plenty of people who've done who've done throwbacks in one form or another in in all forms of of all forms of media. Um, how do you where do you draw the line between what would be considered a throwback and what would be considered anachronistic? Hmm. Uh, great question. I don't really worry about what's anachronistic because um, since if you extrapolate far enough into the future for science fiction. Um, who's to say what goes up and down in civilization? We might have, you know, we might have lost, you know, we might have gained flying to another planet, but we might have lost, uh, you know, our, our cell phone communication. You, n- you never know, like, how that's going to end up in 3,000 years, right? So, uh, we're, we're um, not exactly good at, pre- yeah, not exactly good at predicting, predicting even more, re- doing even more recent predictions. There, after um just as a case in point sorry to get to get on a tangent no worries um 
after World War II, there w there was a mindset that um, in the future infantry would be using um, 308. That didn't go out very well. Because <laughs> uh -huh. 308 is just is just too da is just too damn big to be used as an infantry weapon. Um. Yeah, I I, I understand that. Um, and. So I, I just don't worry about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> is, is what it comes down to. Uh, whatever feels good for the story is kind of what I do. I can understand that. I think it's actually harder uh, to try to do a near-future prediction. So if you do 10, 15 years out, you actually push the shelf life of your story a lot shorter, right? Uh, and then because the, if those predictions don't come true... Uh, you know, you've really dated your story and kind of kind of wreck it that way. The further you push out, the easier it is to kind of avoid that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But since you mentioned world building, were you, did you end up spend before you even started writing the script? Did you end up spending a bit of time writing the writing the setting itself? Well, I had a, a script that was done before, and then I had a short story. And then uh, she started making sketches of some some of the things before we even before I even started writing the script. So I had the base that I had already had a lot of setting to it. That even though I don't have like a formal document that just says, you know, this is this and this is that, um, I have a lot of material that was done that I could draw from. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so that. I, I don't know. I don't know if you want to call that yes or no. It's kind of in between. Usually, these usually with these kind of questions, it's rarely a yes or no thing. <laughs> and if I'm being honest, if whenever it's a yes or no thing, that though it um doesn't give me a whole lot of room to build to build upon. It's the reason That's why true. I, don't, I don't. It's the reason why I don't script my interviews because. I can pre I have a good amount I have a good skill when it comes to predicting things but I don't have a crystal ball and since mm -hmm. so many questions are are building upon previous questions I can't exactly write a question I don't even know if I'm going to ask Fair enough Now one of the other things I fa I found kind of interesting is the fact that you the fact that there's the comic itself, and then there's a prose novel that you're writing as a companion. Um, yes, which I was doing right before the show. I got a thousand yeah. words in in the twenty minutes before the show. In excellent. a weird, in a weird way, this is this is almost like the inverse of what of what I was dealing with with Red Gaze when he put out Sunsworn. Right, because <laughs> he had he had the novel, and then then he had a um. A, compa a companion book to the novel that was far more visual. And I think it typically goes in that direction that you usually find a property that's a book or something like that. Now, I've toyed with that. I've got my uh, Nano Templar series and my, my Steampunk series, and I've always wanted to have a comic book of those. That's always been a dream. Um, but this one, I was just sitting there and I'm just like, I have book readers. I have comic readers. How can I get everybody happy together into like a happy space to where uh, everybody's happy so that they're not going, why aren't you working on what I like to read, right? Uh, which you get a lot. Once you have readers, that, that's, uh, that happens very consistently. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so that's a deal. And uh, I, I, I opted for this because it's just like, okay, well, I'll have a book that's its own story. That's a novel with the characters. If you don't like comics, you can just read it. Mm -hmm. I'll have my comic. If you don't like the books, you can just read that. And it, I hope that you'll cross over for both because you'll really get an awesome picture of this character uh, and, and really get a lot out of it. That, and you'll get a lot more world building out of it, which is cool. Uh, and you can get a visualization out of it. So you, when you're reading the novel, you kind of know the aesthetic of the world and you can kind of imagine that a little easier. It, it seemed like the best of both worlds right there. And Given some of the very varied um, art that I art that I see of that I see of characters in cer in certain books, having having that consistent visual idea when you're re when you're reading a novel is cer is certainly important. Because I remember um, 
I remember seeing I remember seeing fan art of just Wheel of Time, for instance, and there were some things that were consistent between artists, and there were some things that were certainly not. Definitely, um, and I know actually I've I've read uh, the beginning of the adaptation of the Wheel of Time to comics, uh, which Chuck Dixon actually uh, did the script for. He said that was the hardest thing he ever had to write in his entire life because there's so many like uh, just rants and like setting rants <laughs> and little asides and little one-off directions in Wheel of Time that it's really not conducive to a consistent narrative for a comic book. Oh. Oh, yeah, it's, that's definitely the case, and I know I I know I praise Sanderson a lot, but it, but at the very least, he's kind of gotten ahead of that issue with with putting up putting up guidances on that matter. Yes, definitely. And to be and to be fair, the idea of somebody somebody um, having a hard time with adapting stuff from Wheel of Time into another media. Um, I'd be lying if I said that that was the, that that was the first time that story was brought to me because, um, a few years ago I had Stephen S. Long on the show and he he did not enjoy his experience right ri um writing the D twenty Wheel of Time. Hmm. Um. Granted, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure he enjoyed it more than the t than the times when the Tolkien estate would check him regarding the Lord of the Rings RPG. Oof. Yeah, they were they were sticklers back then. I don't. I wonder what it's like now. Um, the Tolkien estate. They were being sticklers was one thing, but the but from what he told me, the the things that they were sticklers about was bizarre. Initially, I had thought, well, they didn't want any. They they wanted they wanted more of the focus on the new line films because those were in the middle of coming out at the time. This was two thousand five. That's not ex that wasn't exactly the case because, for instance, he could reference Return of the King, but he couldn't reference the appendix. Interesting. Or and ah. Uh. Pretty much anything that was in the Cimmerillion, he was told no. Oh, that's sad. Although he, um, although when it came to certain spell descriptions and the like, he kind of snuck some stuff in anyways under their notice. Um, just, just bas basically testing the waters to see what he could get away with. And a lot of, and they probably didn't check that hard. Interesting. I think, yeah, that that's the reason. That's the reason why I, why I say that this, if they if they were just an extreme stickler about about certain things, I'd be fine with that. But they they were so it was so consistently inconsistent. Hmm. That happens a lot with these companies. Although he he did say he had a much easier time working with Paramount because he was also responsible for the Star Trek RPG from Last Unicorn and from Decipher. I had those. Uh, um, I, uh, yeah, I always feel really bad for the, the people who do property brand-based things because, I mean, they get a decent payment, like, in terms of, you know, probably what amateurs would expect. Mm -hmm. But, like, it's hardly enough to live on. The amount of work you have to do to keep consistency with an already established property by somebody else is a lot higher than if you're making stuff up yourself. Um, and then, you know, you really don't get credit for it. Like as a person who works on Star Trek or like a Star Trek novel or comic, you're just the guy who did the Star Trek co novel or comic. People bought that for Star Trek. They don't come and then buy your next book because they're going to come back and be like, well, your next books, you, that's not Star Trek. I was here to read Star Trek. So, uh, you know, I, I definitely feel for uh, those freelancers quite a bit. I do. I, I remember be, I remember being quite an, I remember being a bit annoyed when oh, and this is this was one of those cases of a, of the Tolkien estate not having the best, not having a good mark on their record. 
Um, the most recent, most recent tabletop adaptation of Lord of the Rings is the One Ring. Um, originally Which that I have. was made. Um, first, was it made by Cubicle Seven or Free League? I have the new one. That. The original version was done by Cubicle Seven, which is a UK ba a UK based company who does really good stuff with things like Doctor Who and um and Keen Kuro as well as well as um, presently they're basically the tabletop tabletop RPG guys for war for um both Warhammer Fantasy 40k and Age of Sigmar. And they were working on a second edition of the One Ring, and they were putting up concept art and ca and character art at least tw at least twice a week. I'd see I'd see an article about a character archetype that they wanted to put in the book. Then they got then they got the license yanked, and it, and there was no explanation as to why. Wow. Until 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 eventually, um, Free League took o took over, and while the Free League one is good, I can't I can't help but wonder how what what could have been if they had just, mm -hmm. if they had just let Cubicle Seven finish. That's sad. Especially si especially since um. Unlike the previous attempts, this was the first time that we had a game that was specifically built for Tolkien instead of instead of an existing system that was adapting into it. But you had, you had mentioned you had mentioned augmentations when it came to when it came to your protagonist. Yes. Um, are we? Are we are we talking are we talking some form of cybernetics or what what did you have in mind when it came to augmentations? In I went with I went with bio I went with biological augmentations. Um, there are cybernetic augmentations mm -hmm. uh, in the story, and uh, there's well I guess I'll spoil a little. She gets a forced cybernetic augmentation uh, during it uh, during during the book. Uh, in the middle of it, uh, but but her actual abilities that make her uh, her reflexes and her strength uh, a little more than and her speed uh, more than uh, you know average is uh, comes from uh, biological augmentation. Mm -hmm. um, when you when you say bi when you say biological, are we, to are we talking her her getting treatment to in to um to enhance development? Yes, ge genetic manipulation to enhance development. Yeah, I can I can go with it. I I can go I can go with that, especially si since even though even though even though she even though she is augmented, I don't think you were trying to go full super soldier with her. Yeah, I didn't want to go full super soldier. Um, I mean, I don't know. I just find it kind of cringy when. Uh, women are super soldiers, uh, personally, um, and so I, you know, I, I, that's why I went with the kind of the, the secret agent thing. I, I think it works better as a spy, and you know, uh, she can use her looks uh, to get her past situations, things like that. It just kind of it, it works a little more naturally. I feel like mm -hmm. I, I can, I can certainly get that. Now. I know you. I know you mentioned that the the graphic novel is going to be around sixty six pages, which I'd say is standard fare for a lot of your graphic novel output. Um, yes. What are you shooting for as a page count for the companion prose? I'm shooting for three hundred, but it, it depends on how the story ends up finishing. I'm, I, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm actually in the process of writing that. That's not done yet, mm -hmm. um, and I'm about. Uh, fifteen thousand words into it. Mm -hmm. So, um, I well, from outline wise, gosh, it looks like I'm about maybe twenty percent into it. <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean all all of the outline portions will will be of the length that it is now. So, um, I don't know, but I, yeah, I'm gonna aim for probably three hundred to four hundred pages somewhere in there and if I can. 
I have no I have noticed that when it I was I was gonna I was gonna make I was gonna say something on on um, stretch goals, but you already have that you already have that um set um set up, and I do want to, I do want to offer my congratulations on how well the how well the thing's doing at the time of this recording. You're at sixteen point one k. Yeah, we we crushed it. This is our biggest launch we've ever had by far. And um, there's still more than plenty of time. You got forty four days left. Um. Give, um, given that when if if you end up reaching the bonus pages stretch goal, would that be would that mostly be some of the world building elements? Because I remember seeing something similar with, um, with Dominion. If you yes, know. uh, w so my artist drew like full, um, like full different poses, pull pose shots. She drew. Uh, some little uh, cartoon doodles with uh, with different aliens, and uh, she also drew like kind of schematics for her, you know, gear and things like that. Uh, she drew like a uh, you know a roundabout going all the way around in you know three di D different directions to look at her ship mm -hmm. uh, close up. So I've got I've got tons of material like that. The artist has just been overflowing with content. Um, it's really awesome, and. Uh, We'll we'll put a bunch of that in there. Uh, we'll probably you know I'm I've, I'm getting some good fan art. I might put some of those pinups in there also. Mm -hmm. um, you know what, whatever looks good is what I'm going to end up putting in. Yep. And I I will I will certainly be looking for it. I know I know that um, this clo this closes at the end near the end of July. Um, mm -hmm. What are you shooting for as far as a release window? Are you once the thing closes you're going to try are you going to try and get the digital version out as quick as you can yeah i'm i'm hoping to have the novel done before this closes um so that way i can just as soon as this closes get digital out to everybody um and i do digital out to everybody first for a couple of reasons like one it shows the progress that it's done so it kind of makes everybody happy uh and number two uh when people read through this stuff if they spot a typo or anything that i missed it helps uh, that way. I don't have it in the print edition, right? Um, and so uh, that that that's a uh, that's a little trick I use uh, in order to just. Uh, and of course, I have an editor go through this first already, uh, who's a paid editor. But sometimes things get missed. I want as many eyeballs as things as possible. It'll, it's always helpful, and uh, that'll that'll be the case there. We're aiming for September for the print stuff, um, and I, I hope I can hit that. So. That we'll see with the novel just how this goes. Mm -hmm. Well, I will cert I will certainly be keeping an eye out for how it develops. Uh, and with all that said, I would like to once again thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come back to the temple. You've always been a good friend, Mildra, and uh, I, I definitely appreciate you and your show and. Mm -hmm. I uh, appreciate listening to some of your guests sometimes too, so it's good stuff. Yep. And anytime you see fit to return, whether to further discuss projects or to do something a bit more casual, since I do want I do want to lean into the, into that more often now that I have a better computer. Um, the door is <laughs> always open, as Thanks, I often brother. as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And you guys missed our whole casual discussion about the Power Rangers RPG <laughs> that wasn't recorded prior to this. Uh, sorry, you just don't get to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, it's it's a lot of it's it's a it's covering a lot of stuff that I've talked about in the in the um, episode of Geek Watch where we tried to fix it, and in the review that I did proper. Um. Excellent. But. Of course, and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Like I said, if drinking is not mandatory around here, but it is encouraged. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!